All right, good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending today's webinar on Hainsync 101. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start here in a second, but a couple announcements before we do. I want to let everybody know that uh, today's webinar is going to be recorded, and also uh, the video that we are going to be going through for this. Uh, the webinar is the audio will be uh, transmitted through your PC. So for those of you who are listening in via phone, uh, you guys might want to turn on your computer speaker so you can uh, be able to hear uh, the presentation. Uh, and also feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation in the uh, questions drop down. Uh, we will be answering those at the end of the presentation though. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start this and enjoy. Thank you and welcome to Heatsync 101, an introduction to heatsinks. Topics that we will discuss include what is a heatsink? A brief heat transfer review as related to heat sinks, which includes conduction, convection, and radiation. In addition to heat transfer, we'll discuss other factors that influence heat sink design. Finally, we'll discuss an application example based on the Karma Board from the California Institute of Technology for use in the Owen Valley Radio Observatory. A heat sink's purpose is to allow for more efficient heat transfer from a heat source to the surrounding fluid and environment. Whether the heat is convecting to the fluid passing over it or radiating to the surrounding environment, the surface area is a key factor for efficient heat transfer. It is worth stating that heat flows from higher temperatures to lower temperatures and only transfers when there is a temperature difference. Efficient heat transfer implies that the heat is transferred at a smaller temperature difference. For a heat sink, heat moves from the source, which is the dye in the component shown, and conducts through the component into the heat sink base and fins. From the surface of the heat sink, heat leaves through convection and radiation. Generally speaking, heat sinks are made of a high thermal conductivity material, such as aluminum, for efficient heat conduction, and maximize the surface area for efficient convection and radiation to the environment. Heat sinks come in many shapes and sizes, with a few varieties shown here. The upper left is a plate fin heat sink and is the type of heat sink we will focus on primarily. In the upper right is a pin fin heat sink, which has advantages over plate fin for some scenarios that we'll discuss later. In the lower left is a heat spreader that uses heat pipes to efficiently move the heat from the spreader to a fin stack that presumably is located in an area of forced air at cooler temperatures. The last heat sink in the lower right is an active heat sink. It has an integrated fan that supplies its own source of high speed air to transport the heat away. Let's discuss some of the factors that influence heat sink thermal design. At the device level, there are factors such as component power dissipation and maximum junction temperature. The more heat the component dissipates, the more effective the heat sink needs to be at removing it to maintain the maximum allowed junction temperature. Thermal interface material, or TEM, and IC package style affect the temperature rise from the die to the heat sink base. Higher thermal resistances will require the heat sink to compensate for the additional temperature rise. The system this heat sink will be used in has an equal part in determining the heat sink requirements. How much space is available? What is the ambient temperature of the fluid passing over the heat sink? What is the elevation? Arid elevation is less effective at heat removal. Is the heat sink exposed to forced convection flow from a fan or natural convection where the hot air rises due to buoyancy? Is the system such that the forced air can easily pass around the heat sink rather than between the fins, making the heat sink much less efficient? There are also some practical considerations. The heat sink has to be manufactured, ideally at a reasonable cost. Reliability might also be an issue, which may mean that an active heat sink or a heat sink with an integrated fan that could fail might not be a good choice. The primary focus of Heat Sink 101 are plate fin heat sinks and forced convection, but there are a couple points to make about natural convection before we move on. First, consider the orientation of the heat sink when placed in the system. Is it aligned with gravity? If gravity isn't aligned with the plate fins, then a pin fin heat sink is probably a good choice. It does sacrifice surface area, but ensures that the buoyancy driven flow has a pass through the fins. Second, in natural convection, radiation heat transfer is much more significant than in forced convection. It's common to ignore radiation heat transfer in forced convection heat sink thermal design. It's a conservative assumption. When radiation is significant, the heat sink will benefit from a higher emissivity. When determining the thermal requirements of a heat sink, it's useful to think of heat transfer in terms of thermal resistances. 
Let's take a minute to review thermal conduction and convection in terms of thermal resistances, which are typically shown in terms of temperature difference per unit power. For conduction, this translates to L over Ka, or the ratio of the material thickness and the thermal conductivity times the cross-sectional area. For convection, the thermal resistance is 1 over HA, or the inverse of the heat transfer coefficient times the surface area. Let's use that idea of thermal resistances and develop the thermal budget, which is a common approach for estimating the thermal requirements of a heat sink. The delta T budget is the difference between the maximum allowed junction temperature and the ambient temperature. For the Q, we'll use the power dissipation of the device. As a conservative assumption, it is assumed that all of the heat flows into the heat sink base. The first thermal resistance is the junction to case thermal resistance of the package. For a typical CPU, this value will be in the range of 0.1 to 1 Kelvin per watt. The next resistance along the path is RCS, or case to sink thermal resistance, and the thermal resistance associated with the interface material and mounting method. Values for the thermal resistance in the TIM layer are usually presented in terms of thickness, which is referred to as bond line thickness, and thermal conductivity, or the ratio of L over K. The interface between the component and the heatsink is commonly referred to as the TIM2 layer and has typical values ranging from 0.1 to 1 degrees C inch squared per watt. The last thermal resistance is RSA, or sink to ambient thermal resistance, and is a function of the heatsink thermal design. Before we discuss the thermal design of the heatsink, the sink to ambient thermal resistance, let's discuss some of the relevant aspects of thermal interface materials. Thermal interface materials come in a variety of forms. I have categorized them in terms of pastes, phase change material, thermal adhesive, and thermal pad. Important properties of TIMs include the bond line thickness, the bulk thermal conductivity of the TIM, and the contact resistance at the wetted surfaces. Those parameters define the overall thermal resistance of the TIM. Other important considerations include the associated required pressure to achieve a bond line thickness and the ability to rework the material. The interface material may also have implications on reliability as the overall thermal resistance may change over time. Some TIMs offer mechanical strength as in an adhesive, but many do not. TIMs that require other methods to secure the heat sink in place typically offer better thermal performance. Though thinner bond lines will offer lower thermal resistances, there are situations where a thicker interface material is needed. One example is to compensate for variances in component height for a heat sink mounted on multiple components. The last comment on interface materials is that when designing a heat sink, we use values offered in a data sheet. But the only way to truly know the thermal resistance across the component and the heat sink is through measurement. The next thermal resistance in the thermal budget is the sink to ambient thermal resistance. There are two components to the heat sink efficiency convection through the solid, and convection and irradiation to the surrounding. We'll start by looking at the efficiency of heat conduction within the heat sink. Ideally, the heat sink is at uniform temperature. In reality, this isn't possible. A temperature difference is needed to move heat. The temperature difference, or gradient, across the heat sink base and fins is an area of focus, though. Higher gradients will result in a less effective heat sink design. One heat conduction inefficiency is spreading resistance. Anytime there is a cross-sectional area change in a heat conduction path, there is an associated spreading resistance. An additional thermal resistance beyond that due to the bulk thermal conductivity and the thickness of the material. Situations quite common as heat is conducted from the TIM2 layer into the heat sink base. Determining the spreading resistance is not trivial though, and two sources, resources are provided. The first, from the University of Waterloo, is an online calculator for determining the thermal resistance for a number of different geometries. The second link is to a paper from Song Lee and O, oh, which provides equations for estimating thermal resistance and is very useful in a spreadsheet application. Let's take a look at how spreading resistance affects the heatsink thermal design. Consider the example of a heatsink on a component in forced convection. Flotherm was used to vary the heat sink base thickness. The material thickness affects the spreading resistance while maintaining the overall heat sink height. So as the base thickens, the fins get shorter so the overall height is maintained at 10 millimeters. The sink to ambient thermal resistance is plotted versus the heat sink base thickness. Temperature plots of the heat sink base are shown for the initial design and that of the optimal design. Both plots are shown on the same temperature scale. 
So adding one millimeter to the heatsink base thickness resulted in a much smaller temperature gradient in the heatsink base and resulted in a better heatsink thermal performance. As the heat conducts into the fin, there is also inefficiency loss due to the temperature gradient, which is known as fin efficiency, and is the ratio of the actual heat transfer rate and that if the fin was at a uniform temperature. The formula shown is based on the assumption that the fin tip is adiabatic. The plot shows the fin efficiency versus fin thickness for fins at two heights and two heat transfer coefficients. The fin is assumed to have a thermal conductivity of 200 watts per meter kelvin. The plot shows that at higher heat transfer coefficients for longer, thinner fins, the efficiency is lowest. For heatsink thermal design, fin thickness and material, looking at copper versus aluminum, could be considered to address this. Now let's take a look at estimating the thermal resistance associated with convection from the surface of the heatsink. Though heat conduction is a contributor to the overall performance of a heatsink, the thermal resistance associated with convection is the dominant factor when estimating the performance. For initial sizing of a heatsink, it's reasonable to only consider the fin area and heat transfer coefficient. Typically, the Neusselt number correlation for laminar flow over a flat plate is used to estimate the heat transfer coefficient for a plate fin heatsink. A simplified expression is provided for estimating the heat transfer coefficient as a function of the velocity and fin length, assuming the fluid is air. So this equation is based on the definition of the Neusselt number and the Reynolds number for a flat plate, the Neusselt number correlation for laminar flow over a flat plate, and the properties of air at 300 Kelvin. Recall that the convective thermal resistance is 1 over HA, and from the thermal budget we know roughly what this value needs to be to maintain our component temperature. From that and our estimate for a heat transfer coefficient, we can estimate the surface area requirements for the heat sink. Before we can think about the surface area of the heat sink, we need to consider the effects on flow impedance. For a heat sink on a component on a board, there is an opportunity for the flow to bypass or to go around our heat sink rather than through the fins. Heat sinks with larger fin spacing will have higher velocities in the channel, but would have lower surface area. Smaller fin spacing would lead to more bypass, which means lower velocity in the channel, which translates to a lower heat transfer coefficient, but more surface area. For each design scenario, there will be an optimum number of fins or fin spacing. There is an infinite amount of combinations of fin heights, number of fins, and heat sink base dimensions that could satisfy the surface area requirements. So where do we start? One place to start is with the assumption that the flow in the fin channel is developing and isn't fully developed until it reaches the exit of the fin channel. When the flow enters the channel, a boundary layer begins to develop on each plate, as shown in the image. The flow is fully developed when the boundary layers from each plate merge. As the flow is developing, the fin will have the maximum heat transfer rate per unit length, but also the highest pressure drop per unit length. When the flow is fully developed, these values remain constant. The equation shown provides an estimate of the fin spacing given the length of the fin in the flow direction and the approach velocity. This isn't necessarily the optimal fin spacing, but does provide an estimate. With this value, along with the fin length, you can estimate the fin height required for a number of fins or the number of fins required for a specific fin height. Again, this provides a starting point to understand what physical size a heat sink may be required. Up to this point, we have reviewed the heat transfer modes for heat sinks, some of the design considerations, and a methodology for determining the thermal requirements of a heat sink with the thermal budget. We also introduced two equations that can be used to estimate the thermal performance of a plate fin heat sink. Equations like this are a good starting point for new design, but there are a number of different approaches for heat sink design that each have advantages. Let's compare different approaches with respect to speed and accuracy. Generally speaking, there is a reduction in speed when there is a gain in accuracy. The first method we will consider is hand calculations or spreadsheets. Certainly this would be the fastest approach and can be tuned to be more accurate by adjusting the correlations based on in-house test results. The speed is essentially instant as you test various inputs. This approach is typically used as a starting point, but not necessarily to qualify the final design. The next approach is finite element analysis, or FEA. This would be a 3D numerical analysis that would have a high degree of accuracy on the conduction heat transfer side, but would require the use of heat transfer coefficients based on correlations. The next approach would be computational fluid dynamics, or CFD. This method would be more accurate than finite element analysis since it would solve the Navier-Stokes equations with conjugate heat transfer.
few assumptions would need to be involved then with FEA. I estimate that there wouldn't be any speed difference between FEA or CFD. The most accurate, but possibly the slowest, would be a lab test. A lab test does require a physical heatsink to test, so we have to consider the time it takes to manufacture the prototype. Lab tests should always be part of the process, but primarily used as a design validation at the end of the process. There are tools like Flowtherm that are CFD tools specific for electronics cooling. With Flowtherm, there would be a speed up over general CFD as you could build and solve the model more quickly. Flowtherm also has built-in design optimization capabilities, so many heatsink variants can be studied and optimized automatically. Also, the MCAD and ECAD integration, along with detailed IC package modeling, allows for more accurate prediction over general CFD. We'll take a closer look at how these capabilities of Flowtherm can be used to optimize a heatsink design. The example we'll be looking at is based on the Karma board thermal design for the Owen Valley Radio Observatory. Let's start by looking at the device, system, and practical design constraints. The objective is to design a thermal solution for U136 through U139 that maintains the junction temperature below 95 degrees C. But also, these operating temperatures need to be within 5 degrees C of each other. 13 watt power dissipation is fairly low, so a high performance TEM won't be required. We will assume a value of 1 degree C inch squared per watt. And also, the IC package is a flip chip BGA and has a junction to case thermal resistance of 0.1 degree C per watt. So this information could be used to determine a thermal budget and kind of estimate the size of the heat sink, but we're going to include this information directly in our flow therm analysis. So the Karma board will be placed in an enclosure with the printed circuit boards on a uh, 0.8 inch pitch. So this is going to constrain the height of the heat sink to about 12 millimeters in this case. There are also neighboring components that will limit the length and width of each heat sink. At a 35 degree ambient, it's lower than the typical 55 degree C that we designed too many times. So that's gonna work in our favor. We will, however, be designing this for use at a 10,000 foot elevation, so we'll include the properties of air at 10,000 feet in our flow therm analysis. And we see the approach velocity is 400 feet per minute. The practical constraint of a single extrusion requires that all heat sinks have the same thin thickness and pitch. Since these components only dissipate 13 watts, we should be able to design a light enough heat sink that they could be attached with an adhesive tape that has a thermal resistance of 1 degree C inch squared per watt. Also, at this low power, an active heat sink won't be required. So, as a first step in the design, I analyzed the board without any heat sinks. At 13 watts, there was a possibility that no heat sink was needed. As you can see, though, all the temperatures were over 130 degrees. It is interesting that U136 was almost the same temperature as U139. If all the heat was convected off the components, the temperatures would have increased in order as the air is preheated from the upstream component. In this case, the PCB is acting like a heat sink, and U136 benefits from not having high temperature neighbors other than U137. So they're conducting heat into the board, and the heat can then convect off the board, acting like one big heat sink fin. So the next step, knowing that I need heat sinks, was to go ahead and add heat sinks. Uh, I chose a heatsink length and width that were about the same size as the components at 37 millimeters and a base thickness of 2.9 millimeters, which left 9 millimeters of available height for the fins. I used Flowtherm's command center to explore the design with respect to the number of fins, and each heatsink was constrained to have the same number of fins, so each heatsink is going to have the same exact extrusion. It is interesting that each heat sink had a different optimum number of fins, though only one component, U138 at five fins, lied in the target band between 90 and 95 degrees C. The target band is shown with the light blue shading. Operating temperatures below 95 would certainly be acceptable as long as all the components were within five degrees of each other. Also, 12 fins for U139 isn't necessarily the optimum, it's the lowest value for the range that I studied. The strategy for achieving operating temperatures within the design band was to allow each heatsink to have different fin heights 
and I chose the number of fins to be 10. The thinking behind that was it's in the range that allow the leading component, U139, to have shorter fins than if I had gone with uh, fewer fins. So more fins, they can be less height with the same amount of area. And then that would benefit the downstream components because that leading component would have a lower profile. Also, the most downstream component I thought would benefit by having more fins than less fins to convect its heat away. So after having decided on the number of fins, I needed to study how tall each fin should be for each heat sink. So I used Flowtherm's um, command center for that. I, I set up a design of experiments in Flowtherm's command center to vary the heights of all the heat sinks except U136. I left the most downstream component at fin height of 9 millimeters. So the fin heights, other than the last one, were allowed to vary independently within a range of from 2 millimeters being the shortest to 9 millimeters being the highest. In all, 18 designs were created and analyzed. So this plot shows the fin heights for each design. Notice the distribution of the values across the range. The resulting component junction temperatures are shown in this plot. None of the designs resulted in the components operating within the band, though design 2 came very close. The design of experiments is a great way to study design space automatically, but very difficult to make a design decision from directly. There's a wide distribution of operating temperatures, just as there were a wide distribution of inputs. So the next step in the process was to use Command Center's Response Surface Optimization, or RSO. After doing the design of experiments, I set up some design goals. One was to minimize the difference between the operating temperatures of the components, and I also used an output constraint so that no component operating temperature would exceed 95 degrees C. So the response surface optimization is a mathematical calculation performed by Command Center, and it takes about 20 seconds in this case. And what it returns is the optimal fin heights and a prediction of what the operating temperatures would be. After the mathematical estimate, you need to confirm that prediction with a CFD. So I did that. I, I ran the CFD analysis based on the RSO recommendation, and I'm reporting the output of that. So the components are very close in operating temperature, and, and though U136 is reported at 96 degrees C, I believe it to be within the design requirements at this stage of the design. I've included some references for you that may be of benefit, a mix of textbooks, technical papers, and web links. Hopefully you still have your T-Transfer and Fluid Dynamics textbooks. They most likely will have further explanation on laminar flow in a channel and heat transfer from extended surfaces. I enjoyed reading Hot Air Rises and Heat Sinks and find it to be educational and entertaining for anyone new to the industry. There is also a link to the Karma Award Project for the California Institute of Technology. We have covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time, starting from what is a heat sink to optimizing a heat sink design for four inline components. There are a number of approaches to performing a thermal design of a heat sink but only CFD or physical test of the heatsink in the system provides the actual operational performance for your design. Thanks for listening and I hope you found it to be informative. All right, and now that we've completed that, there is one more slide that I wanted to show. Um, in case anybody also has additional questions after today, please check out uh, the number and email on the screen to give us a call or um, contact us with any information that you would also like to have. And also look at our accelerator, which is our comprehensive and integrated portfolio of software and services. But in the meantime, until we hear back from you guys, we did get uh, a couple questions. Um, and one of them also was getting a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, I believe since this was recorded, we will be sending out a recording after the fact to your emails. So you'll definitely get the webinar later on. Um, so Richard, who is going to be helping us today with some of our technical questions, uh, one of our questions that we got in, during the presentation was, how does the heat sink material impact the performance of a heat sink? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, hi Danny. Yeah, absolutely. So materials of the heat sink, that's really going to determine the uh, the thermal conductivity, right? So higher thermal conductivity, copper is about 400 watts per meter Kelvin. You're going to get better heat spreading, uh, you know, uh, depending on the manufacturer manufactured type of heat sink, whether it's extruded or bonded, that's going to also affect the spreading within the heat sink as well. So material does have a big impact, uh, not just on performance, but also cost. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then a second question that we got was, what is the impact of embedding heat pipes or a vapor chamber into a heat sink? Sure, good question. That's uh, becoming more and more common as uh, spaces become constrained. You, you might need to embed a vapor chamber or heat pipes to better spread uh, the heat in the base of the heat sink. Um, that typically happens in larger heat sinks. So think of um, you know the new NVIDIA GPUs, for example, uh, that those have large heat sinks that need to extract uh, heat from a small die right so you need to spread it out to the edges of the of the uh, of the heat sink so when you have that large discrepancy between die size and heat sink size and you need much better spreading that's when you would want to use uh, vapor chambers or heat pipes okay gotcha all right and then a third question we received was uh, can you comment on heat sink dust fouling and how it uh, reduces performance yeah so this one's tricky to quantify uh you know we normally design heat sinks so that you know they're, they're fresh out the box and they're gonna be that way forever but in reality you know especially if you're using fans to blow air through a heat sink they're, they're going to become fouled right and the amount of dust collection is going to depend on things like the velocity through the heat sink and the boundary layer thickness okay and essentially what's happening is you're, you're creating a coating uh, or an increased thermal resistance between the heat sink and the air. So, you know, the more dust you have, the, the increased thermal resistance and also a narrower channel for the air to actually pass through your cross-sectional area is reduced. So all bad stuff, um, but it's really going to depend on operating conditions and whether it's a forced or natural convection heat sink. Um, but uh, yeah, you can kind of mitigate this situation with things like um, filtering on the inlets uh, or um, other things to kind of reduce uh, dust ingress into the enclosure. Okay, thank you for expanding on that. Um, and then it looks like one of the last questions we have is, what effect does the heat sink mounting mechanism have on heat transfer? Yes, so in the in this video we saw that we were using like thermal tape to attach heat sinks onto the top of the chips directly. Uh, that's fine for low power, you know, thermal tape doesn't have very good mechanical properties or thermal properties to be honest. If you are using something like a thermal grease then you will need like a heat sink clip or you'll need uh, spring-loaded screws or something like that to force it down onto the uh, uh, onto the component or through the PCB. Um, typically when that happens that will affect a couple of things. Um, you know, mounting hardware will reduce the cross-sectional area for the for the air to pass through. Uh, but on the plus side, if you're using like a thermal grease, it will reduce the bond line thickness. There's there's a mounting pressure associated with hardware. The more pressure you have, the more squeezed the grease is going to be, right? And it, it might even come out the sides because, because of the mounting pressure. So um, there's positives and negatives to that, but uh, you know, it's it's part and parcel of using heat sinks. You, you need to mechanically attach them somehow. And again, simulation can help with, you know, before and after scenarios and, and what is the best um, mounting procedure for your heat sink. Okay, thank you. And that looks like that was one of the last questions we had. Uh, before I end uh, today's webinar, I just want to make certain that nobody else has any technical questions or otherwise before. Uh, otherwise, feel free to please give us a call or send us an email at the contact information on your screen.
All right. Well, I think that that's it. Nobody else has asked anything. So thank you very much for attending everybody and Richard for helping us with our technical questions. And please look uh, into your inbox for upcoming uh, webinars that we will have in the future, like HeatSync 201. And have a great day.